Hello, Louisiana. I'm Kerry Martin, and this is the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast for Wednesday, September 4th of 2019. Welcome to the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast, a look at the latest news in Louisiana agriculture. Now, here's the host of the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast, Kerry Martin. Election Day is just around the corner in Louisiana, so we continue our series of interviews with the three major candidates for governor. Last week, we had Governor John Bell Edwards. Today, we have Congressman Ralph Abraham. That interview is coming up later in the podcast. But first, here's a look at news headlines. During a White House press event, President Donald Trump told reporters that income from tariffs on China will help farmers recover from Hurricane Dorian. The president was updating the press on federal preparations as the hurricane moves along the East Coast. President Trump says he'll use money from tariffs on China to help farmers if they're hit. You will have probably some hit on farms up along the coast, and we're going to be able to go in with Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, We have a lot of money because of the tariffs we've taken in. We've taken in tremendous, many billions of dollars of tariffs from China, and we will have a lot of money to be helping our farmers along the coast if they get hit. They may not get hit. There's a real chance that this could veer out the other way, but there's also a chance that it goes straight or it goes left. If it goes left, that's an even different subject, but our farmers will be helped. Trump says he's using money from the tariffs to help farmers in every way he can. Last year, I gave the farmers $16 billion out of tariffs. The year before that, because they were targeted by China. The year before that, I gave our farmers $12 billion. And the way we figured that, I said, how badly have our farmers been hit by targeting from China? And I was told they were hit to the tune of $16 billion dollars. And I made up that $16 dollar for dollar to the farmers. The North Carolina Agriculture Department says Hurricane Dorian creates an imminent threat of severe economic loss of livestock, poultry, and crops ready to be harvested. Corn harvest is wrapping up in Louisiana. The latest Louisiana Crop Progress and Condition report shows that corn harvest is now 84% done. Both farmers and elevators have been working overtime to get this year's crop out of the field. Romeo Stalling is a merchandiser with Consolidated Grain and Barge. Corn harvest has been steady. Uh, most of our peak season has been coming around August, mid-August. Uh, kind of trying to slow down, kind of put a bow on, on corn harvest as of right now. We're trying to dump them as fast as we can, get, get those trucks turned around uh, and get them back to the field. That way they can steadily do it, what they do best and you know harvest their crop. Rice harvest is wrapping up as well. The report shows rice harvest now 75% complete. Soybean harvest is picking up steam, although it continues to be behind the average pace. Soybean harvest now 16% done. The average pace is 28%. As we mentioned here on the podcast yesterday, sugarcane planting continues to run behind because of constant rain showers in south Louisiana. Cane planting now 29% done. The five-year average pace is 48%. And we're getting sweet potato harvest underway here in Louisiana. 7% of the sweet potatoes now out of the field. As far as crop condition ratings are concerned, here's how a few of the crops shape up. Soybean conditions, 7% excellent, 55% good, 29% fair, and 9% poor to very poor. Sugarcane condition ratings, 14% excellent, 50% good, 30% fair, and 6% poor to very poor. Cotton conditions, 9% excellent, 63% good, 23% fair, and 5% poor to very poor. Research is continuing here in Louisiana to combat our number one soybean pest. Don Molino has more. Dr. Jeff Davis, LSU Extension Service Entomologist, 
is conducting research funded by the Louisiana Soybean Grain Research and Promotion Board on the best way to control the red banded stink bug. We're looking at new and current insecticides. There are several products coming out on the market, hopefully in the next couple of years, that do a very good job of controlling red banded stink bug. With the insecticides that we have, what, how can we improve seed quality? Seed quality is always an issue, especially this time of year when we're ready to harvest. What can we do to stop stink bug feeding to improve seed quality? And we found out some of the neonicotinoid insecticides actually do a pretty good job of reducing feeding. They may not kill the red banded stink bug as well as, say, acephate, but they do a good job of preventing or at least slowing down feeding. And so we can actually improve seed quality by using those insecticides as we uh, kill off those red banded stink bugs. We're looking at different uh, stink bug controls, uh, putting them out at, say, R3. When we know the red banded stink bug from our previous work actually has the most females out there. With the most female populations out there at that point, usually in the R3 beans, we see the most egg lay, and that we want to be able to control those populations early so we don't have to put out as much insecticide later. Now, this year we tested that at several locations, and we've been able to hold off brain. Instead of three applications for red banded stink bug, we've been able to cut it down for, uh, to two, and in one location, one. So we can really reduce those by trying to spray and catch those insects just as they're mating and just as they're ovipositing on those soybeans. I'm Don Molino on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. Now let's look at the markets on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. The corn market continues to fall apart, but we did see a higher close today in both soybeans and wheat. That's according to Jack Scoville with the Price Futures Group in Chicago. Yeah, they really did, and there didn't seem to be any obvious news. Um, there's been some trouble getting some of the USDA uh, reports out. Uh, for example, the um, uh, daily export sales announcements, which were friendly, actually, for, for soybeans. We sold Mexico for, uh, 450,000 tons, and that was, uh, of course, bullish for the market. But uh, the market didn't react right away, and it could be that it took a while to get that news spread around. But the dollar's been weaker all day. And I think that's had a lot to do with it. And let's face it, you know, uh, while the beans haven't been uh, quite as beat up as the grains have, but both corn and corn and especially wheat have uh, been getting pretty overextended to the downside. And I think we're seeing some short covering uh, as we start to see some of these private estimates come out and as we start to uh, focus our attention on the reports next week. September soybeans up six cents, closing at eight sixty-two and a half. November beans up seven, closing at eight seventy-five and a half. But as we mentioned, the corn market just cannot find any footing. September corn down three and three quarters, three forty-six a bushel. December corn down two and a half, three fifty-eight and a half. September wheat was up nine cents, four fifty-six and a quarter. The rough rice market has seen nice strength here over the last week or two. It finished slightly higher today. Mark Tall is a rice marketing specialist with the Louisiana Farm Bureau Marketing Association's rice office in Crowley. Well, the futures market is hugging the 1197 per hundred area on November futures, especially over the last four trading days. We have continued to hug closer to the upper end of the Bollinger Band, which indicates a short-term slowdown in buying. Positive and fresh news would be welcome about this time in order to boost us to the next level. The next noticeable level would be targeted at 1252 per hundred, and this was actually hit on July 29th. Iraq is looking to purchase additional rice in the very near future, but really this is going to be a global tender and not a U.S. tender only. On the long grain cash market, we have traded anywhere from 1111 picked up per hundred to 1155 delivered, all based, of course, on the 62 over 70. Harvesting is going very well here over the last few days with good weather. The only thing, we have some extremely volatile fuel yields at this point. So we'll see how this goes. But we're approximately 20% off from uh, last year. September rice was up one and a half, closing at 1170 a hundredweight. November rice up a penny, 1198 and a half. Now with a look at the cotton market, here's Don Molino. Cotton futures slightly higher in the front months on Wednesday. Census trade data showed July cotton at 1.4 million bales, the largest monthly total since 2007, down 15% seasonally from June and 30.6% larger year over year. 
Nash reported Monday 36% of the U.S. crop had reached the bowl's open stage ahead of the 27% average maturity. At New York yesterday afternoon, New Crop December Cotton 58.17 up 31, March Cotton 58.77 up 21. The spot market price 56.77 up 46. I'm Don Molino on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. At the Kinder Livestock Auction, Kinder Louisiana this week, two to three hundred pound steers brought a dollar ten to a dollar eighty five a pound. Three to four weight steers a dollar to a dollar sixty five. Four to five weight steers brought ninety cents to a dollar fifty a pound. Five to six weights brought eighty to a dollar thirty five. With six to seven hundred pound steers bringing seventy cents to a dollar twenty five a pound. Red cows range from three hundred fifty dollars to eleven hundred fifty a head. Pairs range from four hundred fifty to twelve hundred a pair. On the futures market, live cattle were lower, October down twenty five ninety nine oh two, but feeder cattle closed higher. September feeders up a dollar forty one thirty five fifty five. October feeders up a dollar thirty two. In just a few short weeks, we'll head to the poll to choose a governor for the next four years. And to help keep you informed, we continue our series of interviewing the three major candidates for governor. Last week, we had Governor John Bell Edwards. This week, we're interviewing Congressman Ralph Abraham, who is running for the office. We'll have that interview coming up next on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. This is Trace Atkins for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. Growing up in Sarepta, I could see the value of agriculture every time I left the house. Whether it was timber going to the paper mill or cattle in a pasture, I knew the farmers, ranchers, and landowners were keeping my hometown on the map. And the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation helps keep them in business. So join the Farm Bureau today. Become a member at LAFarmBureau.org or call your parish Farm Bureau office. The Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation, the voice of Louisiana agriculture. The Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. We continue our series of interviewing the three major candidates for governor. Today, we talk to Congressman Ralph Abraham. Congressman, how are things going for you today out on the campaign trail? Always doing good. Thanks for having me. Well, Congressman, you and I have talked many times over the last few years, and normally when we interview We talk about issues, things that are going on in Washington, D.C., but today I want this interview to take just a little different direction, if you will. I want our listeners to get to know Ralph Abraham, who you are, the role that agriculture has played in your life, and why they should vote for you for governor. So let's start with the first question. Uh, Let's go back. Uh, Tell me the background of Ralph Abraham, who you are, where you come from, and the role that agriculture and farming played in your upbringing. Oh, it's played a, uh, a very influential and a daily uh, thing in my life, and it still does today. You know, as a young boy, grew up on a small farm, I had some cattle, I grew some crops, and as we uh, got a little older, we uh, were able to purchase uh, more properties, uh, farm grew, family grew, and, uh, you know, we grew with it. So, you know, agriculture, whether it's uh, farming, ranching, uh, you name it, uh, you know, I've had uh, my toe in the water and sometimes up waist deep in it all of my entire life. Uh, we still farm extensively where Diane and I live now. We, we As I'm talking to you, uh, we're in the middle of a uh, – farm that has got cotton on it this year we tried to get some corn in but uh, it was so wet we had to uh, put cotton in this year you know moving through the years my early childhood it was just wonderful being out in the uh, rural Louisiana being out in the country exploring doing the things that uh, young boys do to get into trouble and to stay out of trouble and uh, you know as we got through uh, high school and certainly into the college years you know my roots are always back in the field of agriculture and it's always good to uh, come home and you know get my uh, hands dirty and my feet wet and do the things that i enjoy doing every day well when you decided to pursue a career path you decided to become a veterinarian so i can only guess that a a love of animals and uh, of course uh, your agricultural background played a role in choosing that career path 
Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, as again, the younger boy, I saw the need of the uh, cattlemen, the horsemen, uh, you know, those people that had the farm animals and how difficult it was at times, if even possible, to uh, get a veterinarian out when they needed some medical attention. So, uh, I, I, you know, I ran the barrels, ran, ran the poles as, as a high schooler. Uh, so was stayed on a horse half of my life as a uh, as a younger guy and it just morphed into that career in veterinary medicine and i can't say enough of those uh, wonderful years of being the uh, veterinarian it, it it was all good well i guess uh vet school wasn't tough enough you decided to actually go back to medical school what in the world prompted you to do that you know when i was practicing veterinary medicine again in a very uh, small rural community right here where I live now in northeast Louisiana, I saw also the need uh, on the human side of people that just did not have access at times to uh, the medicine and certainly to the uh, medical care that he or she needed. So Diane and I talked about it, and uh, we decided that, uh, you know, if we could uh, get into medical school, then, uh, you know, we could come back to the same community and practice on the human side, and we were fortunate to do that. Uh, to your point, I don't know which is harder. Uh, veterinary medicine is a very uh, difficult curriculum, but so is human medicine. So they're right there neck and neck as far as the uh, the technical difficulty as far as getting that degree. But, uh, you know, we persevered, got both of them, and uh, now we uh, we practice mostly on the human side when, when we're not uh, doing other things. Well, let's fast forward up to 2014. You made the decision to run for Congress in a very agricultural district. Uh, tell me why you did that, and let's talk about the role that agriculture has played during your time in Congress. Yeah, well, Diane and I, again, we sat down and talked about it, just didn't like the direction that the country was going. Uh, certainly the uh, lack of attention that was being uh, given to our agricultural friends and families. So we decided to make a run for the U.S. Congress. Again, fortunate to win that election, and once I got there, you know, my first priority was to ask and almost demand that I be put on the Committee of Agriculture. And fortunately, I was. I've been there ever since, still am there, and hopefully am promoting, uh, working, fighting for, uh, again, the people in our agricultural communities that are, as everybody listening to this program know, uh, work from can to cane, uh, try to make a dollar, try to hold on to a dollar. It's a tough life. But worth the reward if you can uh, if you can make it work, Congressman. You have representative one of the largest agricultural districts in the country. Uh, tell me about uh, the experiences you've had representing such a large number of farmers and a large number of acreage of farmland. Yeah, with the fifth congressional district, it's one, if not the largest row crop district in the nation. And my background, again, I can put pretty much any crop in the ground that I need to and drive any piece of farm equipment uh, even today. So having that knowledge base, actually having got into the field doing the things that it takes to make a crop, certainly that gives me the uh, the knowledge base, but it also gives me the credibility to uh, voice and represent the farmers, ranchers. When I go before Congress, when I testify in those committee hearings and when I my voice should resonate, and it does resonate as far as moving legislation forward that helps the people in agriculture because I've been there, done that. What do you feel like has been uh, some of your biggest agricultural accomplishments in the five years you've been in Congress? We, we, you know, we got the farm bill through, which was a heavy lift. There were certainly Many, many members of Congress that didn't want to see that happen for a variety of reasons, but we did do that. Uh, my office specifically has worked uh, very closely with our RAC of all countries, believe it or not, to get uh, right now almost 300 million metric tons of rice uh, sales to that nation. And we will continue to uh, work on those relationships and, and get more, I hope, down the road. We uh, are working hard to get the USMCA deal, the new NAFTA deal across the line. Unfortunately, the divisiveness of Congress right, right now 
Speaker Pelosi doesn't want to bring that up uh, because it would give President Trump a win before the 2020 elections. But it is a good bill. It needs to be ratified. And for Louisiana, it is a multi-billion dollar uh, export industry. So we need to get that done, too. Now you're running for governor. Um, let's talk about what a Governor Abraham could do for agriculture here in Louisiana. Somewhat of the, exactly the same thing on the federal level. Just tell that agricultural person, that family, that I've got their back. I understand the struggles. I understand the fears, and I understand the commodity markets being so volatile that uh, we on the state level will do everything we can to shore up, uh, firm up, and just hopefully make it a little bit easier uh, to try to make that living from a farming type of environment. Again, I understand how tough it is out there, and my hat goes off to all those that get up at sunrise every morning and usually don't go to bed until way after sunset uh, every day to, again, try to feed their families. So hopefully they understand most, I think, if not all uh, the people in Louisiana know that uh, we're for them and we're going to continue to fight the fights and do what we can to uh, to make to make it work for them. Congressman Ralph Abraham, thank you so much for the time and best of luck to you out there on the campaign trail, Doc. You guys have a great day, guys. Bye-bye. Well, that's two down, one to go. We have reached out to the Eddie Risponi campaign on several occasions and in several different ways. And as of right now, I have gotten zero response, none whatsoever. So we'll keep trying and hopefully we'll be able to get Eddie Risponi on to ask him some of these same questions. That wraps up the podcast for today. We'll check back with you again tomorrow. In the meantime, be sure to connect with us on social media. We're on both Facebook and Twitter. The handle is at Voice of LA Ag. We'll see you tomorrow right here on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. Thanks for listening to the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. This podcast is produced by Kerry Martin and the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. For more information, be sure to check out our website, voiceoflouisianaagriculture.org and lafarmbureau.org.